And here we are back with America's Gilded Age. This is part two, Transformation of the West. Essentially, most of the history of the United States up to, uh, actually into the 20th century, is a history of migration from the East to the West. And when we talk about the West, there are lots of different regions within the West. Michigan used to be called the West. Uh, the Dakotas and Kansas were called the West. Texas was the West. Uh, eventually, we get the Southwest, which is the parts that we, we, we took from uh, Mexico. And there are uh, a whole variety of, of patterns of, of, of politics and of uh, different ethnic groups and ethnic combinations and different types of communities and different economic uh, uh, um, approaches to the West. And it is uh, really, while the rest of the world, while the rest of the, of the Western world uh, is uh, getting colonies, uh, really we're building the United States empire across the continent as we uh, capture or purchase more and more land until we essentially have from sea to shining sea. And at the end of the 19th century, as we're continuing this expansion, um, we really vastly increase uh, the, uh, the amount of land that's under cultivation. Um, this is with the railroads. We are, this way you're able to get the crops uh, to Chicago, from Chicago out to just about anywhere. Um, towns are being built very, very rapidly, about as fast as people can get there. Uh, the towns start to fill up and get, get started. Um, and we get in this central section, basically North Dakota to Texas, uh, we get a massive production of both corn uh, and wheat, and this really becomes the breadbasket, not only for the United States, but ultimately for um, much of the world, as we, especially as we go into like World War One, and then later into World War Two. But for most Americans, the West is seen as a beautiful land somewhere off in the distance, a, a fantasy, a, a tranquil place where uh, where nature is, where uh, there are peaceful Indians, and they, uh, the, the whole world is, is just this beautiful place. Um, the only problem with that picture for most people, of course, is the fact that it's already populated with large numbers of Native Americans, and they're not really seen as much of a problem because, of course, there's no reason why you can't just wipe them out and uh, steal their land. There are a number of difficulties for this Great Plains uh, Western expansion, and one of these is the fact that where does the water come from? There is a huge aquifer that, that runs right under all of those pipelines that they're running from North Dakota to Texas, uh, and so there's a lot of groundwater, as there is you know, here in, in California, and we know how that works. Um, but he, even, even here, the majority of our agricultural water comes in the form of snow. And for us, that snow is uh, dumped onto the mountains to the east of us. There it piles up. When it starts to melt, it uh, trickles down through streamlets and rivulets and, and eventually to rivers. And then we've dammed up most of the large rivers where we capture the water, and then we distribute it from those. In the Great Plains, however, um, most of the of the elevation is already quite high. It's 3,000 to 5,000 feet uh, is, is really the, the elevation of most of the Great Plains. So they don't really have mountains as such, but they do get lots of snow. Anywhere from um, in, in the northern half of the Great Plains, they get a lot of snow. I grew up in North Dakota, and tr trust me, there's a reason that I still live in California, uh, and that is to avoid the snow. But that snow is what irrigates the crops all year round. Here, it goes up into the mountains, it melts, we put it in the reservoirs, it's cool. But we still store our water as snow. In the Great Plains, that doesn't work because there aren't mountains and, and so you really can't build reservoirs as such. So what you want to do is, is the snow covers the ground, and it's big and flat. It's like the, this valley, only it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles wide instead of just a couple hundred miles wide. And the snow covers it, very, very deeply, and then as it melts, it trickles into the soil, down into the upper layers of, of, of the, the, the topsoil, and down in a little bit below that, and when, then when you as soon as the last frost is gone, you plant, 
and then it uses the water that it acquired through the winter to nurture the plants throughout the growing season. If you don't get enough snow, you don't get enough water, you end up with uh, a potential of losing your crop. And so there were discussions about um, building irrigation districts in the plain states. Didn't go anywhere primarily because most of the plains states were populated by small homesteads. Um, these were populated by, uh, you, know, f you know, these are basically 40 acre farms and the, the uh, amount of engineering that would be necessary to uh, construct reservoirs uh, along the edges of the Rockies and then f try to funnel all that water uh, into the central part of the country would be absolutely um, horrendous. Uh, as it was, the, the engineering feat that built the California water system is, is pretty amazing, but it would have to have been three to four to five times that size in order for it to work. And really the small farmers that were there weren't the types of, of, of commercial entities that would have really been able to take advantage of that uh, project. Essentially, the uh, solution at this point was then to take um, really just to take the system as it was and so at the end of the 19th century um, we built lots and lots of small farms in the Midwest that's how my family got there and this is uh, this is not my ancestors but this is a lot of how many of, of my ancestors uh, and um, possibly some of yours also uh, acquired land we always talk about in this country where it's a land of opportunity and one of the reasons why it was an opportunity, we don't have these opportunities anymore, but one of the reasons why this was a land of opportunity was because at the, at, in the late 19th century, even into the early, early parts of the 20th century, uh, you could still homestead. You could still get land for free and that's what this family is doing. They've moved here, this is in North Dakota, and they have built a sod house. That house is made up of bricks that are made of just simply cutting the grass and the the dirt that the grass is growing in the turf and cutting it into bricks and then stacking it up and then laying sheets of it on the roof and essentially they are living in a dirt house uh, looks like it got a little bit of a lean there so they shoved that little branch probably the only branch they could find um, uh, to prevent it from falling down the reason that they did this is because in order for the homestead to become yours, you had to materially improve it within the first 12 months. And so this, they've, they've built a well. You can see that there's a water pump because there's a windmill right behind the, the house there. There's a shed for the animals. There's another shed on the other side. There's a small house here. Uh, and they have made improvements. Now, the photographer that took this picture came by a year later, and this was all gone. What was there was a white fenced house uh, looking like any middle class Midwestern home that it should be, a little white, white house with a picket fence and the whole nine yards. So this was how tens of thousands of Americans got their property. Uh, that's how they had that property to pass down to their subsequent generations. Um, my, my great grandfather and his two brothers uh, at one point held huge holdings in uh, southern North Dakota. Not that anybody cares, uh, not that anybody would want that land today, but it, it actually is very quite valuable agricultural land, but who wants to live in North Dakota? But they got every inch of that land simply by being homesteaders. It was free. And so, you know, we often talk about how the United States is a country where people, even humble, uh, you know, immigrants can rise up from nothing. It used to be true. It is not true anymore. There's no one saying, look, we got free land for you. Just come out here and build a house. No one's giving anyone 40 acres anymore. So un understand that so many of the Americans are like families like mine. They're saying, you know, we, we came here and we pulled ourselves up and we made it from nothing. You know, they did it with a lot of help. Now, as we get farther west and we come out to, uh, especially when we get to California, we really see a, a huge change. It's much more of a corporate um, development. Originally, if you go back and look at the uh, sales literature for the, like here in the Valley and at the turn of the century and up to the uh, first 30 years of the, of the 20th century, you'll see a lot of advertising all over the world. I've seen ads in Russian and German and French, uh, Italian, 
uh, trying to get people to come out here and get a farms of 5, 10, 20, 40 acres. And that brought many people here. But by the time we get to the 1920s, which is a little bit beyond this, this particular point, but it's actually the roots are laid here at the, at the, at the end of the 20, 19th century, we begin to see really the beginning of corporate farming, where we begin to see um, large land holdings, where these uh, uh, small farms are then, uh, you know, many of them are, 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 are gotten by homesteaders and small farmers that have no experience farming or no experience farming in, in say, for example, here in California, and they fail. And so within a few years, they would sell the land to someone else, and then these the farms would get bigger and bigger, and you see this gradual consolidation over the, the 150 years or so that we're talking about here. Um, the other one I want to talk about real quickly is, of course, the cowboy. Now, the, the legend of the cowboy, the cowboys and Indians, the, the cattle drives, all of that stuff, the American cowboy, which is based on, the, the, uh, um, on a Mexican model, of course, is uh, very short-lived. There's about a 20-year period where... Um, uh, the where cattle is driven from Texas up into uh, to Kansas and from Kansas all the way up into Chicago. By the time the can the railroad makes it to Kansas, you don't have to take it much farther. It isn't much longer before the the railroad goes all the way to Texas, all the way to California, all all basically connecting everything. And it's cheaper and better for the cattle to put them on a train than it does to to drive them across the country, especially a country that has been being chopped up by barbed wire. We always think of the Pony Express. Pony Express only lasted about 18 months, so much of that history gets so overblown. There's probably, if you took all the footage of, uh, uh, of Pony Express riders from old Western movies and strung them together, it would take up more time than they actually existed uh, in real life. But the West was marketed worldwide. Uh, this is actually from a, a map book. Um, uh, the, this is, happens to be an illustration that next page would be a map of, of this general area. But this is uh, of uh, Lemoore, south of here in Kings County. Now it says Tulare County because at the time Kings and Tulare were a single county just as we were in Mariposa County and then Mariposa was broken up and became Fresno County and then Fresno County was broken up and became Fresno and Madera County. So there have been a lot of changes here. But I love this picture because uh, in uh, I often ask students to um, break this down and, and tell me what they see. And there's a number of things that I want students to pull out of this particular image. And so uh, we'll go through it uh, kind of together. If you look at the, the, this image, and again, this is, is uh, the residence and ranch of H.P. Gray, east of Lamore in Tulare County. And so the first thing that you see is you see this lovely house in the middle of, of the, the image. And it's surrounded by what are actually rather formal gardens. This is a very nice middle, upper middle class, uh, uh, very symmetrical. You can see all the plantings are very small, so it's a very, very new place. Um, and it's uh, fenced off so that the, uh, uh, keep the, the vermin and the other uh, animals and all that out. And you see a, a, a woman, I would assume it's the mother or maybe uh, a member of the staff, uh, if they have staff, uh, and a child playing in the yard. And, and across the driveway, you see um, the family garden. There's probably three quarters of an acre to an acre there in food for the family. And you can see that it's trimmed by trees and a nice uh, tree-lined drive. And in front, of course, there's this lovely, nice, wide dirt road. Um, and people are able to ride by and, and uh, uh, you know, there's, there's access. These are important things because we're looking at, the, you're not going out to the wild west, you're going to a civilized place, and hence the formal gardens. That you're going to go to a place where uh, prosperity is available to you. You have a place to grow your own food, you have a place for your livestock. Behind the, the garden you'll see a, a barn and there are horses and mules and, and there's cattle and there's, uh, there's farm equipment and a small orchard behind the farm and, and you have access with the, the, the roads and, and so you can get your goods to market. In fact, behind the fields, behind the big fields, the the uh, the cash crop that whatever, whatever it is that they're growing there, uh, you see the railroad and of course the railroad is is the, that connection that connects the the uh, uh, produce 
to the market. And then behind that, you see more land. It is an expanse that goes beyond that all the way down to the river. And that's probably the south fork of the, of the King's River running along there. You see the trees running along. And then behind that, there's more open space. It just goes all the way off until you, you can't see any farther in, uh, down the horizon. And so uh, essentially, this, is, uh, this image from before the turn of the 20th century is a, an advertisement for uh, why you should leave Volga, Russia, or why you should abandon Italy, or you should uh, um, uh, leave the Azores and come to Central California, and you can basically start with uh, very little, and who knows the, the sky is the limit. But as I started to say before, there were, there were two other um, aspects that I want to, want to cover talking about the, the transformation of the West. The one is that it is really large corporate enterprises. Um, the, the large commercial farmers will very rapidly begin to, to come in and take over, as they, as they continue to do today. Uh, most of our farmland here is by uh, a few very, very large um, uh, farmers. I, don't, I, don't, I hate to call them farmers. Landowners. They're really not farmers. Most of them live in Los Angeles or San Francisco. But the, these are, are large entities. Uh, that employ uh, large numbers of people, but these are not small family farms. These are not the um, uh, farms that, that um, Thomas Jefferson had envisioned that would, would give us a self-sufficient populace. These are our corporate farms. And the same happened with not only with farms, but also with the, the gold rush at the end of the, of the, the second half of the 19th century. Um, no one ever made any money during the gold rush. The only ones who made money were the people that sold people shovels for $100 a piece or the people who sold uh, eggs or produce, um, people who made biscuits, people who could wash clothes. Um, really, almost no one made money because uh, the miners themselves made no money because inflation was huge. And they were constantly ripping each other off. There were gamblers were, were out there, prostitutes were out there. It was an absolute mess. Nobody actually started making even a regular living until large um, mining corporations came in and hired the prospectors to work in the mines or to work uh, knocking down hillsides with water cannon or, or things like that. And so it was the large-scale uh, extraction uh, industry, not the small prospector who actually made it rich in the gold rush. Same with the farmers. Farmers came out here, got the land, eh, not so much. It's really, again, the large corporations that would eventually take over. The other in, uh, issue that, that uh, we had throughout the entire West was uh, Native Americans. And really, second half of the 19th century uh, just continues um, the genocide. Um, it, it, it really is a uh, a, a part of our history that we have never addressed. Uh, and until we do, until we address the two big uh, sins of, uh, of America, the, uh, the genocide of 100 million Native Americans and the uh, enslavement of 4 million uh, people of African descent and the, the uh, treatment through Jim Crow and other, other racist practices for 450 years, uh, until we actually address those and come to grips with those, uh, as Germany has with their Nazi past. Uh, until we do that, we will continue to have these problems in each generation. We, um, it, it's, it's one of the things that history can help us deal with. Uh, but at the time, of course, what we're doing is we're trying to clear the land because we have white people that want it and there are natives on it. And so most of it is, uh, most of the push is to uh, clear them off, get them into places that people don't want, and um, and or eliminate them here in California. The state legislature actually paid a bounty for Indian heads and scalps, and that was one of the ways to control the Indians was just to send people out to kill them. By the time we get to the 1850s, uh, we, we have what are really called the Indian Wars, and these are the U.S. Uh, federal forces, uh, the forces that will then move into the Civil War a few years later, um, are really just traveling across the, the West, uh, doing everything they can to capture and to contain Native Americans as much as, as possible. And this continues through the Civil War. In addition to uh, trying to physically eliminate Native Americans, um, there were other attempts to eradicate them. And one of the ways was through assimilation. There was really an attempt to dismantle 
uh, the, the, the native way of life. Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to his nephew that um, he wasn't worried about um, Native Americans. He was worried about if, if, if African Americans were freed, he was afraid that it would, would be a, a very bad thing. Um, can't imagine why. He would wonder that, the way he treated them. But um, Native Americans, he thought, uh, according to this letter he wrote to his nephew, um, would eventually disappear because they would be assimilated. And that really continued for well up into the well up into the 20th century uh, as a uh, the, one of the ways of trying to get rid of the Indians was to just absorb them and they would disappear in that way. I, I show this image to show really how um, Easterners coming west um, approached the Midwest. Um, there were millions of bison, not buffaloes. Buffaloes live in water in Africa. These are bison and in India. These are bison. Uh, there were millions of these bison roaming the, the, the plains in, in massive, massive herds. And just as there were millions of Native Americans who lived in North America, and the concept of manifest destiny, God gave us, gave us white people, essentially is what they were saying, uh, the right to conquer the North American continent. And anything that stood in the way was um, to be moved out of the way, whether that is going out on, on hunting expeditions by just riding on the train. I mean, this is not a, a train that stopped. And, and some, I, guess maybe, I think it has stopped at this point, but they often used to just ride through the herds with the trains and people would get their Winchester rifles out and start shooting through the windows and try to drop as many as they could. But the attitude was the same towards the people that were already on the plains and in the Rockies and uh, along the Cascades and, and here along the West Coast. Uh, the attitude is the same, the um, entitlement is the same, and unfortunately, in many respects, the results were the same. One of the ways in which we, and by we I mean the United States, uh, attempted to assimilate Native Americans was through uh, the Indian boarding schools. And I'll show you a film in just a minute, but uh, I want you to look at these two photographs, and I want you to look at them quite carefully because these are the same children, the same young men. On one side, on, on your left, is their arrival uh, at the boarding school in their traditional native dress with their own names, their own religion, their own language. And on your right is a photograph taken probably the next day. You can see it's even got the same floor. It's a slightly different background. It's the same three kids. They've had their hair cut off. Their clothes and the clothes of everyone else who came in on that same day would have been put in a pile in the middle of the, the courtyard or behind the school and it would have been burnt in a burn bonfire. They would have been issued new clothes after having been uh, scoured with DDT and, and, and scrubbed clean and forced into shoes, forced into uniforms. They were given new names, Christian names. They were indoctrinated into Christianity. If they tried to practice their own beliefs, they would be beaten. If they spoke in their own native tongue, they would be beaten. If they used their own names, they would be beaten. In the year 1879, Native Americans lay in the crucible of the melting pot, America. It was an age of exploration, of change, 
symptom of manifest destiny, man's journey into the uncertain west, was the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, the flagship of Native American academies across the United States. Native American assimilation was first initiated in the late 19th century when many tribal children began to attend government and church-operated boarding schools designed to offer better integration into the new yet pre-existing American culture. Having been no pioneer in the field of cultural reconstruction, school founder Richard Henry Pratt served in the Southern Plains as captain of the 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers. It was during his service that Pratt's social beliefs regarding Native Americans evolved closer and closer to that of a prejudiced disposition, one savage, foreign of Eastern Euro-American nature. He kept at hand his principle that the Indian is born a blank like the rest of us. It would be an age in which more than 30,000 native children would be pulled across the very continent they once called home in order to be taught how to be the equals of Americans. In the year 1879, Captain Richard Henry Pratt successfully founded the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, the first federally funded off-reservation Native American boarding school located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where were once prison barracks were utilized to construct an institute of education and cultural rehabilitation. As Carlisle and its sister academies grew throughout the United States, Native American culture quickly found itself being burned alive. Pratt was ordered by the U.S. War Department to travel to Dakota Territory and recruit Native Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota children whose educational statuses would be opportune for rehabilitation. These tribes were selected because of their growing opposition to U.S. outreach and failed Indian agents who sought negotiation. In his meeting with the Brule Lakota chief, Chief Spotted Tail, Pratt expressed, you intend to let your children remain in the same condition of ignorance in which you have lived, which will compel them always to meet the whiter man at a great disadvantage through an interpreter as you have to do? As your friend, I urge you to send your children with me to this Carlisle school, and I will do everything I can to advance them in intelligence and industry in order that they may come back and help you. Life at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School was a severe and foreign experience for its students, as mere children below the age of 18 were separated from their beloved families and cultures. Upon their first arrival to Carlisle, students were introduced to chalkboards, as scrawled before them were the assembly of random symbols, at which time they were told to give up their tribal names for ones rather of the English language. Promptly after selecting new names, students were involuntarily cut of their hair, given starched uniforms, and trained to march in place. Having been born in the last traditional days of the Ogala Lakota tribe, student and Carlisle poster child Luther Standing Bear wrote, Whites believed the Indian children could not be civilized while wearing moccasins and blankets. Their hair was cut because in some mysterious way, long hair stood in the path of our development. They were issued the clothes of white men. High-collared, stiff-bosomed shirts and suspenders fully three inches in width were uncomfortable. White leather boots caused actual suffering. Pratt's educational officials within Carlisle were found by the students to be acutely strict of rules and regulations, responding with harsh disciplinary tactics when broken. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School maintained a guardhouse as a placement for punishment, frequently in setting students into isolation. Students found it to be intensely difficult to comprehend and trust the accuracy of information teachers supplied to them, doubting the Victorian morality the school assessed. One day, an astronomer came to the school and gave us a talk and explained that there would be an eclipse of the moon that following Wednesday at night at 12 o'clock. We did not believe it. When the moon eclipsed, we readily believed our teacher about geography and astronomy. Wrote Standing Bear, recalling his academics. Pratt, citing his various outlets during his military service, believed it was apt and even therapeutic for students to be taught a variety of trades and practical skills, those having been agriculture, carpentry, printing, and cooking. Well considered the face of American athletics and willpower, Sack and Fox native Jim Thorpe attended Carlisle at age 16, his participation in sports having included track and field, baseball, football, lacrosse, and even ballroom dancing. Thorpe competed in and won the U.S. gold in both the decathlon and pentathlon races during the 1912 Olympics. His image stamped upon Carlisle is one rare, even hopeful in its light. Despite participation in athletics having been highly encouraged, it was not required. Some students instead took classes that studied the arts, these having been music and drawing. 
Aiming to mask or replace their representation, teachers ridiculed the students' traditional values as lessons were often geared toward assimilating students to pieces of modern and European art forms. This taught students to remain silent of writing and further sharing their Native American expressions. Daily life, their very simple life, at Carlisle conjured an intangible murky effect. The self-esteem and self-image of students, their very Native culture, was blinded in the smoke of a different world. Native American academies weakened the cultures of tribes, influencing the course of their very existence. Toward the end of the Great Sioux War and Native negotiation, the 1890s led to the collapse of Native stronghold in America. When federally funded reservation schools increased throughout the United States, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School slowly began to diminish in its significance, entering the first decades of the 20th century weekly. It was no longer deemed imperative for children to travel expensive fares to academies where they could now attend newly funded public schools that were simply more convenient. When Superintendent Richard Henry Pratt began to face the pressure of faculty debates from both the Indian Commission and the U.S. Army, rumors began to spread regarding the closing of the school. Subsequently, a congressional investigation narrowed in on the school's dying management over commercialized athletics. In the year 1918, the American flag was lowered for its last time at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School as students were sent home or transferred to other off-reservation boarding schools. Inevitably, students wrote that they returned home as white men. It was for most students that the return home was met with rejected handshakes and denied eye contact, as well as the painful memories and mental illnesses that went on to participate forever in their minds through cognitive distortion, depression, anxiety, nightmares. It was a return home to outcasting, isolation unlike any other. As for those who could not return home, more than 180 gravestones lay at rest before Carlisle. The called white man's disease, primarily tuberculosis, claimed the lives of hundreds of students at the school whose bodies, for most deaths, were not returned to the families. Some were buried, others cremated, in the land of an unfamiliar people. Carlisle was the landscape of a terrible genocide, a cultural genocide, one written in the blood and tears of mothers, fathers, and children. Despite having been promised cultural rehabilitation, Native Americans were thrown into the crucible of the melting pot, America. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School composed the perfect American tragedy, the robbery of a people and of a livelihood. And so by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, we're really looking at a project that's been going on since, well, essentially since 1492, and that is to uh, displace, uh, destroy, remove, kill, um, obliterate uh, the native population, the people that were on this continent at the time that white people got here, and uh, make room for white people. And uh, this, can, this accelerated as we added new western states. Of course, the technology of the railroad contributed to this, uh, both before and a little bit during. And then, of course, after the Civil War, uh, there were um, uh, many soldiers who went out, opened forts into, as they opened up the, the wilderness, quote-unquote, uh, they would open up forts, settlers would then follow, and they would be under the protection of the military. The Indians were rounded up and placed on reservations and, and uh, essentially were taken out of the general population. And one of the things that, that I, I want to show this, this particular image, again, this is uh, taking Indian land away and giving it, uh, essentially uh, selling it to, uh, to white people. Uh, and you'll notice that that's Sitting Bull sitting there in the, in the middle of that poster. Essentially, Sitting Bull becomes the image of the Native American in, in most people's eyes. Uh, by the time we get to the 20th century, um, Sitting Bull has been captured, 
Uh, he's been imprisoned on a, on a reservation. Um, he goes from being a mighty war chief. Sioux didn't have full-time chiefs. They had head men. They had medicine men. Uh, he was a medicine man, also involved as a war chief, as a, as a, a general, essentially, a military man. And um, as he got older, um, and of course where they're, they're living, is it's very, very poor. They're completely impoverished. They're not able to hunt. They're not able to, to really do anything other than live off government subsidies. And Sitting Bull really becomes a clown. He will join Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and he will essentially live out his days uh, making a living, but basically being a performing monkey, a, 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 the other on display, the um, participant in a freak show. Throughout this time, there's an imposition of white values. Christianity is forced on, on most of these tribes. Um, the ideas of, of property ownership. Uh, and, and we will go in and out of, of different attempts to um, make Indians live on reservations collectively, or we'll take the reservations, break it up, put it into small farmsteads of 40 or 80 acres, give each Indian a, a farmstead, and then sell off the land. That's actually what's going on here with this uh, with this particular poster that that 350,000 acres of Indian land is land that wasn't needed because they assigned uh, smaller plots to individual Indians. The treaty system, the, the mechanism whereby the United States government deals with the governments of these subject nations. In the Constitution, Native Americans are, are considered to be um, separate but dependent nations that exist within the, uh, the United States boundaries. And so you're looking at a situation where um, the, it, it's government to government. And prior to this period, it's all done with treaties, just as we would treaty with Mexico or Canada or uh, wherever, England, France, Germany, Sudan, you name it. Um, and it really becomes more of a departmental. Uh, the, Indian, uh, uh, Indian, the Department of Indian Affairs really just kind of takes over the management of the Indians. Uh, there are laws passed that affect them. There are policies that affect them. But uh, no longer do they really have the equal say as that separate subject nation. Usually at this point in the face-to-face -face classes, I'll ask my students, who is a college football fan? A few of the guys will usually raise their hands, and I'll ask them, who are the Sooners? And they'll say, well, that's Oklahoma, uh, University of Oklahoma, OU, Oklahoma University, uh, OU. And I'll say, how did they get their name? And the students will go, I don't know. Right? Mascots are, are strange that way. Well, this is a picture of the Oklahoma land rush. And if you remember I, earlier, I was talking about my grandparents. Uh, they weren't in this particular land rush, but they were. this was part of the homesteading of the West. This is the federal government giving away hundreds of thousands of acres to white people for farms. And basically, uh, big sections, this is happen it happens to be in Oklahoma, big sections would be um, uh, cordoned off. There would be a stake. That's where it gets its name, claiming a stake. Uh, there would be a stake somewhere within each of those plots of land, 40 acres, 80 acres, depending on what they happen to be. And people would line up at the starting line, a gun would go off, now the land is available, and you would rush to the piece of land you wanted or to the nearest one. You would grab that stake, and then you would take that stake into the land office, and you would be given title, free and clear, of that particular piece of land. And those that got the first bits of land were got their land sooner than others others did. And so those who grabbed the first parcels of land that are closest to the start line were referred to as Sooners. And that's why Oklahoma is, uh, Norman, where Norman is, is, is in the eastern part of the state. It is considered uh, the home of the Sooners. The Sooners are the people who populated Oklahoma, all given free land. Uh, and many of them were in Calistoga Wagons, which is the mascot of, of, of OU. And so that's how they get their name. But this is also how white people get control of the land, that the majority of which belongs to, uh, belonged to Native Americans until we claimed it. In the 19th century, we decided to extend citizenship, as, as, you know, as Thomas Jefferson said, the Native Americans would be absorbed into the white population. Never has completely happened. It's, it's, it's about as close as it's ever going to be now. Uh, but there was this, this offer of citizenship to 
uh, to Native Americans. And this is important to understand. As we get into the 20th century, there'll be a number of ethnic groups who will attempt to become citizens. Japanese Americans, uh, Indians from India, uh, Sikhs and, and Punjabis. Um, these uh, groups will attempt to become Americans, but because they are neither Native American, which is covered in uh, the Constitution, they are not black, which is covered in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and of course they're not white, which is what it was assumed that the Constitution was written for. Uh, as late as 1921 and 1922, respectively, Japanese and uh, Indians uh, could not become citizens because they weren't one of those three groups explicitly mentioned uh, in the Constitution. And the Supreme Court, in two cases, we'll talk about much later, uh, simply denies it because they're not one of the three groups that are mentioned specifically uh, within the um, Constitution. There are um, judicial challenges, um, many of which go against Native Americans, um, but these will 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 essentially allow Native Americans to have a type of citizenship. They're American subjects as opposed to American citizens. Um, eventually, and by the time we get to the middle of, uh, like I said, by the time we get to the 1920s, uh, Indians are just considered to be not only citizens of the United States, but also citizens of uh, their separate subject nations. And as we get to the very end of the, 20, of the 19th century, we see an expansion, an expansion of the ideas of pan-Indianness, of a uniformity, uh, uh, or a, a, not, a, not a uniformity or conformity, but a, a, a beginning of a consensus of what it means to be Indian, not what it means to be Cherokee or Choctaw or uh, Ogallala, but to be Indian. And the birth of this really falls down to um, the ghost dance at the end of the 19th century, where um, you may be familiar with a powwow. Uh, a powwow is, is uh, whether it's a powwow or whether we're talking about a, um, a potlatch, which is how we get the word potluck, but a, a powwow, which you can, we have one uh, here on Fresno City campus every year. There's one at Fresno State, usually around New Year's. Um, there's others around. There's several up in the, in the foothills in different places. And basically, powwows are where um, they would be normally, traditionally be held at the conjunction of various people's territory. And this would be the time when groups, sometimes even groups that were fighting amongst each other, would come together and they would exchange um, produce and technology. They would uh, share stories about how the herds are doing here, how the rice is growing there, how the acorn is growing there, uh, and they would exchange this information. It was also a period to broaden and deepen your gene pool, and you would go and you would get, take women or men um, by consent uh, from uh, other uh, other groups, and you would then, you know, infuse that through marriage into the, the gene pool in your particular group. Uh, sometimes the men would go to the women's tribes, sometimes the, tr the women would go to the men's tribes. It just depends on the, the traditions in that particular area. And in the late 19th century, uh, a uh, Native American prophet had a, a vision, and through the uh, application of a uh, ceremonial dance known as the ghost dance, which was the ghosts of all of the natives that had been killed by the white men. They, they, he believed and many of his followers believed that through the ghost dance uh, they would gain the power to essentially drive the white man out of North America. And this was viewed by the government and both local and regional and, and statewide and federally as a, a huge threat because it, it threatened to uh, re-energize Native Americans and instead of uh, being able to subjugate them, we would be back in a position where we would have to fight for every inch. And so it was outlawed, it was uh, heavily uh, enforced, and we get one of the worst massacres of... Um, of the Indian Wars, and it's the, the Wounded Knee Massacre. And essentially, this is a, uh, a, a village of old men and women and children, because all the warriors were off, uh, that essentially U.S. military troops just went 
through the villages, um, murdered as every, every essentially everyone. Most of the women and children were molested or raped at some point. Uh, the old men, many of them, beaten to death. It was a horrible, horrible massacre. And then, of course, this is in the winter in South Dakota, and they just left. Uh, the bodies, and so by the time the bodies were discovered a few days later, they were essentially frozen through and 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 stiff, and it's uh, quite a stain on um, on the U.S. Uh, attempts to deal with Native Americans, but it also was was kind of the straw that broke the back of of, of Native American resistance. There was really uh, very little reason. Um, to uh, continue to try to uh, resist white encroachment on territory, primarily because they saw it as as a hopeless um, waste of time. Essentially, this map shows um, the bulk of the main reservations that we still have today. Now, it, California is a little different. We have uh, both reservations, which you see on this map, um, but there also are a large number of rancherias, and rancherias are... Uh, kind of um, re reservation light, let's put it that way. And so um, it, is it isn't necessarily uh, any traditional land. If you remember a few years ago when they built Chuck Chansey up in, in uh, Coarse Gold, um, w the land that was the rancheria uh, that was set aside for that particular band um, wasn't a good place to build the, the casino. So they traded some of the land and reclassified uh, the new land that they had as Indian land, and the old land was unclassified as Indian land, and that allowed them then to have the casino and the, the concert hall and the hotel and all the stuff that's up there. Um, that is um, kind of how we do stuff out here in California. But if you look at the rest of, of the country, you notice there aren't that many that are actually in the East Coast. They're all basically from the Midwest uh, to the South. And these are the only areas that are, are really left um, to um, Native Americans on the North American continent. The two most populated areas you see uh, up in South Dakota where it says Sioux Tribes, uh, that's Standing Rock, and that is uh, the most heavily populated um, uh, reservation in North America. It also is the poorest location, the location with the highest levels of poverty anywhere in North America. That includes uh, in, in, North, in the United States and Canada. It is the poorest uh, population anywhere on the planet, or I, I mean in, the, in, in the continental North America, excluding Mexico. The other large one, which has a smaller population but actually goes across four states, is of course the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. And that wraps up part two, Transformation of the West. And we'll be back next time, and we will look at the uh, part three, uh, the final part of America's Gilded Age.